It says, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Let's pray. Father, today I ask that in this place that we would realize what it means to be truly blessed of the Lord. That today, Father God, we receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. And so in this place, I pray that when we leave, we would understand what it means to be blessed by God, by the power of his never-ending word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. And so we started this series a couple of weeks ago. Of course, last week we celebrated the resurrection, had a special message for that. If you were here with us, we're so glad that you joined us. But we want to continue on this uh, for the next few weeks anyway, talking about the blessings that God has for us. And Psalm 112 is a, a psalm that our family has loved for years, talks about the blessings of God and the characteristics, if you will, of God as well as the man who delights in his commandments. And really, it's a picture of a person who's complete, who's mature, who's stable, who's fixed, and established in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 37 says, Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. In the King James Version, where it says blameless, the word there used is perfect. And let me ask you this morning, and you can't lie because you're in church, how many perfect people do we have here today? How many are perfect? Yeah, we all make mistakes, don't we? We all, but listen, listen, Jesus, Jesus did a work for us. I didn't hear what she said. I said, Pastor, but oh yeah, well, far from. But listen, here's the good news. I'm just as bad as you are. But here's the good news. All right, probably worse than some of you. But the good news is that Jesus, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, that he made our souls perfect. Uh, we are perfect before the Lord. So what happens is when we receive Jesus Christ in God's eyes, we're perfect. And God views us as he does Jesus. Therefore, we're perfect and we're blameless. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Philippians, Paul the Apostle starts to talk about how God is working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. How he's given us the desire and the power to do the things that please him. And so what happens is the blessings of God, the perfection of God, start on the inside and it's something that works its way out into our lives. As I was meditating on that just this morning, I looked up the definition of the word perfect in the English dictionary. And listen, this is what it means. Having all the required or desirable elements, qualities, and characteristics as good as it is possible to be, ideal, model, without fault, faultless, flawless, consummate, quintessential. There you go. There's a great word. Exemplary, best, best example, illuminate. Copy book, and it just goes on and on and on. Absolute, complete, total, real, out and out, thorough, thoroughgoing, downright, utter, sheer. How many get the point? All right, so perfect, and really it's a description of God because God is the only perfect one. But as I started to think about it, I saw that perfect also is a verb, which means to perfect. How many heard that word? So he's perfect on the inside, but he is perfecting me. Say, I'm perfect, but he is perfecting me. Look to the person on your left, say, you're perfect. Look to the person on the other side and say, you're perfect. Look at the person behind you and say, I'm praying for you. All right. But here's the thing. We're perfect on the inside, but he is perfecting on the inside of us and working it out. And listen what perfect means. It means this, completely free from faults or defects, to improve, to make perfect, Bring to perfection, better, polish, burnish, hone, refine. Constant. See, God is working in us to what will and to do his good pleasure, perfecting in us the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Say, say I'm, perfect. I'm perfect. And really the challenge is, is since the creation of man, the enemy, the devil, Satan, tries to get in and cause us to doubt that God is good. If you look at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the original sin, if you've ever read the account in Genesis, he approaches Adam and Eve and says, did God say? He wants us to be double-minded. Because if you're double-minded, you won't be able to allow God to perfect the perfect work of Jesus in you and through you so that other people can experience that. And so he knows if he keeps us double-minded, if he keeps us doubting God, that he's got us right where he wants us. See, here's the thing. The devil wants us to think that God is bad and that he's good. I remember this old ACDC song. Some of you may remember it with me if you're a little over 50. Some of you may have heard it on the radio 
I'm on the highway to hell and all my friends are going with me. There's a party there. Oh, yeah, I believed that till I was 31, got saved. Praise God. All right? Maybe your friends are going to be there, but it ain't going to be no party. And see, what the devil wants us to think is that he's got great things planned for us and that God hates you and that God has a boring life for you. Listen, I tried everything I could till the age of 31 to entertain myself and to fulfill any desire I had, and it always came up empty. Oh, it was okay for a while, but how many know you wake up with a headache the next day? Come on, somebody. Some of you have been there too. The rest of you don't go there. But the devil wants you to think that he's got nothing but good things and that God is judging you and keeping you at arm's length. Listen, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus. And now the perfect one can live on the inside and he can perfect his work on the inside of us. God has nothing but great plans for you. Everything in God's plan is for your benefit. But in James 1.18, it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so the devil wants us to continually doubt God's goodness, continually doubt what God's word says, and then we're unstable in our relationship with him and our faith is useless. See, when we're double-minded, we don't know who we are in Christ. And the truth is, true prosperity, listen, prosperity includes money, but prosperity, and we're going to talk about it this morning, really is a condition of the inside of a person. And, and, and healthy money, healthy relationships, healthy work environments, all those things flow out of a prosperous spirit and a prosperous soul. You cannot obtain and sustain outward prosperity when you're inwardly unstable. And so the devil knows that, and he tries to keep you doubting and questioning God. It's a hard issue. For, Proverbs 4.23 says, says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. We need to be delivered from our mindset. I mean, so many times people say, well, so-and-so, they messed up, but, you know, they got a good heart. No, the Bible says our heart's wicked, desperately wicked. But the good news is that God can give us a new heart. That's what Jesus does. He gives you a new heart. Even at our best, we fall short of pleasing God in our own efforts, and so we need help. Double-minded in the Greek means having two minds. It means confusion. Here's what confusion means. Lack of understanding uncertainty, a situation of panic, a breakdown in order. Some of you may say, that's right where my life is right now. Well, I've got good news for you. It doesn't have to stay there. If you're in a place that's out of order, if you're in a place of panic, if you go from one situation of panic to another situation of panic, from one breakdown to another breakdown, I've got the hope for you today, and his name is Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, peace is a person. And maybe you've already received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're going through something terrible right now. Well, peace is a person, and that peace on the inside is going to bring the prosperity of God into your life so that you can prosper in every area. Two weeks ago, we talked about three perspectives of instability in our life and where it's going to affect us. Number one is your relationship with yourself. Listen, you've got to love yourself. You've got to think you're the greatest thing around. That may be hard. It is hard for them. But you've got to get up in the morning knowing all the knuckleheaded things you did to this point in life. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love you. Amen. Come on. I mean, you know, the devil wants you to think you're a loser. He wants you to think that everybody else is better than you. That, oh, you blew it when you did this or when you thought this or when you looked at this. He wants to keep you there, but you need to get up and say, no, I'm new in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Come on. You know, God gives us a new day. I love that about God. You look at his whole creation. He could have done whatever he wanted to. And except for a couple of rare places in the world, all of us get nighttime and daytime. You get 24 hours. Sun rises, it sets, and what does it do? It does it all over again. Why? Because you get another chance. His mercies are new. How often? Every morning. See, God wants to give us a second chance over and over and over. People say that God is the God of the second chance. I say God is the God of the second chances because he never quits. He just gives us another opportunity to receive him and better our lives. So your relationship with yourself, you need to believe that you're God's favorite. You'd be wrong because I'm his favorite, but you should believe it. You should. You should believe God's your favorite. Don't let the devil think, well, you messed up and God hates you because you'll start to not like yourself very much. 
Number two, your relationship with others. See, the way you see yourself, the way you view yourself affects your interpersonal relationships in a big way. You've got to, you've got to love yourself. You've got to like yourself if you're going to have good relationships with people. And this is such a struggle for so many people. So you say, boy, I've tried to get good friends, and boy, they just don't stick around. The Bible says that he who is a friend shows himself friendly. Listen, friendships are not easy. Oh, I, I, it's easy to meet someone, say, hi, how are you? Give them a smile, give them a wink, give them a handshake, buy them a, a drink or, or buy them something to eat. But it's hard to work on lifelong relationships. How many know what I'm talking about? There's something called forgiveness. You've got to forgive yourself. You've got to forgive them. You've got to work on it. I tell you, lifelong relationships are worth every bit of your effort. So your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others, and the final perspective of that instability in your life is going to affect is your relationship with God. And that's what we're going to continue to talk about this morning. Okay, everybody look at me. This is a revelation for some of you, okay? I'm going to move that or I'm going to knock that over right there. Thank you, Sean, for leading worship yeah. this morning, helping us out. We're like that. But I don't, I don't want to hurt myself here, so. All right, look at me. I want you to get a revelation this morning. God wants you happy. Some of you would. He wants me holy. God wants you happy. See, in the kingdom of heaven, holiness and happiness go together. A holy person is a happy person. Oh, I'm not saying because you got it all worked out. Remember, the perfect one is perfecting me. Is anybody with me? All right. But, but holiness means simply set right or set apart. It doesn't mean that you crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's. Well, God doesn't want you to just cast all care to the wind. He wants us to allow him to work. And you should be a better person at the end of your life than you were when this started. How many know that that's good as part of his plan? But holiness has to do with his work. And he wants you happy because you're set apart. In the book of Timothy, it says that we can be a vessel ready for the master's use. I want him to use me. How about you? And so you and I need to realize that we're set apart. Psalm 112, verse 1 in the Amplified Bible says, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God. I want you to know this morning you're favored by God. Is the man who fears the Lord with awe-inspired reverence and worships him with obedience, who delights greatly in his commandments. And the truth is, people want to be happy. Don't we? We spend our whole lives wanting to be happy. The problem is we run from this thing to that thing to another thing to the other thing, and we run all over. Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He said, seek the kingdom of heaven first, and all these things would be added to you. See, the whole world is seeking happiness. We live our whole lives trying to find the perfect job, trying to find the perfect husband or wife, trying to find the perfect place to live. And if we don't like the weather here, we find some place that's got great weather all year around. And then they got big bugs, and then they got... All right, <laughs> hurricanes and I mean, it, it just, you know how I mean no, you can get some happiness from this world, but it won't bring everlasting happiness, and it certainly doesn't bring peace for very long. So that's why Jesus said, "Seek the kingdom of heaven first, and all these things will be added." See, God wants to bless our lives, but He knows that prosperity, true prosperity, flows from the inside. Why do you think so many people lose the prosperity they get. You think of someone who wins the lottery. Maybe you're a gambler. Maybe you were at the casino last night. I don't know. Maybe you play the lottery. But you know the statistics prove that most people that win the lottery, most people, not all, but most people are broke within a year or two of after the money they get. And I'm talking lots of money because they don't change who they are and they spend every dime of it. All right? See, only true prosperity can flow from the inside. True prosperity and peace is saying, you know what? I might be living in a tent right now, but this is a good tent. And God gave me this tent. And I'm not trying to make fun of anybody or light of anyone who's been homeless. Don't misunderstand me. But you and I need to thank God for where we are because prosperity comes from the inside. Some of the happiest, most joyful people that I've met in my life are people that have the least when you, when you regulate it by what our standards are in our society, because we think happiness and peace comes from stuff. We love stuff and use people. We should use stuff and love people. Come on, somebody. Amen. People spend our whole lives wanting to be happy in pursuit of happiness. 
And the truth is, happiness has become so hard to find that some of us believe it can't be found. We think, I'm never going to be happy. And because we're miserable, we make others feel guilty when they're happy or satisfied. I know I've done that in my life. I'm just confessing my sin to you. I know you're a lot further along in your perfection than I am. But I know there's been times in my life, I have to admit, someone's doing good and it's rough for me at the time, and I'm like, nah, 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 nah. How many know you're sitting next to a person that's just like that? You, right? Okay, come on. No, no. It's not you, it's them, all right? But the truth is, we need to realize people are not the enemy, uh, and God wants every one of us happy. But so many times we're jealous of other people because we don't have true peace and happiness on the inside. And so when somebody else is promoted, when somebody else gets a breakthrough, we're jealous of them, and it consumes us, and it steals every bit of joy that maybe we've had to that point. And we continue to get more and more cynical until we get to a place where eventually we even doubt the favor of God and his existence because we've allowed ourselves to become bitter and angry because of disappointment in this life. Don't let that happen. If you're at that place in your life, I've got good news for you today. God wants you happy. Say, I, I am, am happy. happy. Yeah. God's thoughts concerning you and your peace and happiness are much higher than you could possibly imagine. Happy people are prosperous people. No guilt, no condemnation, no shame, no fear. I don't care how bad you messed up. God wants to get you back on track. The stable-minded enjoy the blessings of peace and prosperity. When you learn to be content with what you have, you get more. Because you know even if you don't get more, you're satisfied with what you have, and that is what peace and prosperity is all about. It's something that flows from the inside out. Blessed, happy, and prosperous people are peaceful people. Peace leads you to make uh, different decisions in your life concerning money, your career, your relationships, your family, and the peace of God starts to really overtake your life, and prosperity increases. And what ends up happening when we allow peace to be the overflow in our lives is ultimately we become peacemakers, not peace lovers. A lot of us are peace lovers, and so what we do is when friction starts to happen, we say, well, I'm just done here. Nobody loves me around here, and we're somewhere else. And so we have a hard time having long-lasting relationships. But listen, a peacemaker fights for peace, and it's something that comes from the inside. See, I think peace lovers just like to fight and argue. And they have to have this constant contention in their lives because it's based in pride. Contentious people are double-minded people. They see strife as something that's normal and natural and everybody has to deal with it. But the truth is, a person who understands the peace of God understands that strife is detrimental to their prosperity and so they fight for peace. And that may mean you may have to say no to certain relationships. So I'm not saying that. But so many times we just run and we need to work at peace. It's something that's worth obtaining and worth keeping and fighting for. Because the truth is you can disagree with somebody and still be peaceable. You don't have to fight with someone. You don't have to be contentious with someone. You can just say, you know what, I've got peace. I'm praying for their peace. We're done. We're just not going to discuss that anymore. I love you, and you move on into your relationship. You don't have to leave them. You don't have to go somewhere else. You can continue to move forward in peace and prosperity in that relationship. 1 Peter 3.10, it says this, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace. Say, seek peace. And pursue it. Part of seeking peace is keeping our tongue. <laughs> the Bible says in another place that in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. The truth is you can talk too much. Now, don't use that as a weapon when you get home on your spouse. All right. But the truth is you can talk too much. Nothing wrong with talking, but we need to make sure that our words make sense. The Bible says that a wise person speaks words that are health and healing to other people they come in contact with. 
And so we need to watch our tongue. If we're going to be people of peace, the way that we obtain peace and fight for and keep peace is by the words that we sow into ourselves, our relationships, and ultimately the things we speak before God are so important for our peace and prosperity. Psalm 133 says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You know, when people are committed to be people of peace and to fight for peace, what comes is unity. And where there's unity, God commands the blessing. He doesn't just suggest it, he commands it. When there's unity, when there's peace, the Bible even says that God, when our ways please the Lord, he makes even our enemies be at peace with us. See, God is the peacemaker, and if he's on the inside, we can be the peacekeepers, and we can live for peace, and we can fight for peace. And you cannot have peace and prosperity if you don't control your tongue. See, God wants the church to model his peace to the world. Sometimes we get caught up in gossip. We get caught up in strife. Let me just charge you this morning. Don't argue. Don't fight. Don't stir up confusion in other people's lives. And if somebody's like that in your life, don't keep company with them. Pray for them. And don't allow them to speak that deceit into your life. See, the church should be a community of peace. And as members of the body of Christ, fighting for peace is something that's so important in our marriages, in our homes, in our friendships. 1 John 4.20, it says that you can't say that you love God and hate your brother who you don't see. How can you love God who you don't see and hate your brother who you do see? Some people say, well, you know what? It's just me and God, and I've had it with the church. I don't need relationships. Every time I've tried to have relationships, people just hurt me. Well, welcome to the club. That, That happens in life sometimes. And so what we say is, I don't need it. It's just me and Jesus. Now listen, Jesus should be your only source. Don't misunderstand me. People should not be your source, but God has a plan for us, and part of his plan is community. And so we need to work at having peace with other people. If we hate and have bitter and envy and those things in our, in, inside of us, the Bible says in James that that's sensual wisdom, and it's from the devil. Envy and wickedness and hateful and cutting and mean. Because the truth is, we can pray all year for peace, but if we're not rightly aligned in our minds and in our spirit, we will never obtain the shalom peace of God. It's something that comes from the inside. We can pray and pray and pray, but we need to allow God to start to work it out through our relationships with ourselves, with other people, and ultimately with him. Romans 1, 7, it says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace, which means prosperity and shalom, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God has shalom, prosperity, and peace. It's all wrapped up in one. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The problem is we live carnal lives all week. Do whatever we want to do. Running here and running there and staying out till all hours and don't read our Bible. Don't pray for people. Just live mean lives all week, and then come to church. We want to prophesy or or sing or, how you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored, and put on the church face. The truth is you can't just come to church and get your little IV drip of religion and have it last. Oh, you may feel good. We hope you're inspired by our services. That's part of why we do what we do, because Jesus wants you to be on that IV drip 24-7. Come on, somebody. So you got to do more than, than pray. you got to work it out. you got to fight for peace. You need to be happy with who you are. You need to be satisfied with the friendships and the relationships. I don't care if you just have one friend, and maybe they don't seem that good. You be the best friends you can to them, and God will bring you more. It's the truth. You may say, well, we're never going to have enough money. Stop saying that. Say, thank you, Lord, for what we have, and find somebody to share it with. When you start to share out of what you have, you can't help but get more. It's just how God is. That's how peace and prosperity is. It flows out of a heart condition. Don't allow the devil to get you beat up and bitter and angry and think that you can't have good relationships because that's a bunch of malarkey. There's a great word. My mother used to use that word. You're full of malarkey. 
What is malarkey? I don't even think it's in the dictionary, but it's a country, yeah. Malarkey is a country. All right. I'm from malarkey. The northern or the southern part? No, it's, it's, uh, the western part of malarkey. Thank you. All right. <laughs> it's fun. How many had mothers that made words up? Anybody else? Okay. It's not just me. <laughs> She used to always say, too, you know, you keep acting that way and you're going to end up in Timbuktu. Timbuktu? See, when I remember I moved from Detroit, I moved up over to western Michigan, and I saw Kalamazoo, and I thought, is there a Timbuktu? I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you, you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. I had a little book when I was a kid. It said Kalamazoo and Timbuktu. And this is not a lie. I remember thinking, Kalamazoo's a place? Is Timbuktu? Well, we found out this morning it's a country. <laughs> See, in Romans chapter 12, it says that we should not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. You shouldn't think like everybody else. That's the truth. The words that come out of your mouth should be words that feed others. They should be full of the mercy and the love of God. But you know what we want to do? We want to judge everybody. You need to judge your own words. You need to judge yourself before you can possibly even thinking about judging somebody else. But the problem is in the body of Christ, we want to judge this person's lifestyle and that person's lifestyle. And then we just hide our own sin because we don't love ourselves very much. We don't like our relationships. And we're even kind of mad at God. Oh, I know I'm getting a little bit <laughs> stepping on some toes this morning. But it's the only thing that's going to help us. Got to get you out of Timbuktu somehow. I'm going to preach you out of Timbuktu if I have to. <clears throat> but the truth is you can't be carnal all week long and just come to church and put on a church face and think that everything is good. That's not how peace and prosperity work. It comes from the inside. You need to be meditating on the Word of God, being spiritually minded, allowing the Word of God to wash you, to renew you, to start to think like God. Remember Jesus hanging on that cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. That's for me, everybody. That's for you. You need to make that personal. Jesus said, forgive those who hurt you, who abuse you. And look at his example. If someone's hurt you, if someone has misused you in a relationship, look at the example you have. Now, I'm not saying you should be a doormat. I'm not saying you should allow people to step on you time and time again. There's, we can't have boundaries in our lives. But listen, a lot can happen through forgiveness and peace and unity and prosperity, when we start to think the thoughts of God, and don't get so caught up in the moment. See, I said this Wednesday, I've said it so many times over the years, and I'm going to say it again. The answer to your prayer is not the answer to your prayer. It is, isn't it? The answer to your prayer is not the answer to your prayer. We think, I can't pay the bills. I need more money. Now, that may be true, but that's not the answer to your prayer. The answer to your prayer is a person, and his name is Jesus, and he's what? The prince of? Come on, somebody. So the answer to your prayer is peace. It's prosperity from the inside. It's not more money. It's not a, it's not a promotion. You know that they say that 70% of people hate their job? Welcome to the club, right? I mean, come on now. <laughs> I wasn't saying I hate being a pastor. I love being a pastor. <laughs> I'm one of those three that loves their job most of the time. All right. But, you know, most people hate their jobs. And so I was talking with someone earlier this week. I said, they're in a job. You know, they're believing God for something better. And listen, if you're in a job that isn't satisfying you, work hard, have a plan for God to do something else and see him work miracles. But control your attitude where you are. I can remember there was a time in my life, one of the roughest times of my life to that point. This is quite a number of years ago. I'm thinking Tony's 30, so he had to, this had to be 20 years ago. Oh, my goodness, it's 24, 25 years ago. How old did I get? All right, anyway, your kids start to be 30 years old, and I'm still 40. I'm not understanding that. And, and Trish is only 25, so I, but she looks 25. I don't look 40, but, hey, I can lie sometimes. But I remember that there was a time that God worked in, a, in a, I, I don't have time to share the whole story, but to that point in my life, it was, it was the most challenging time I had as a young man, as a Christian, as a father, as a husband. I was believing God for great things, but I was full of pride, and he's still working some of that out in me, but boy, I've come a long way. And I was a little apprehensive and just 
wanting to believe God. I wanted to see great things, but, you know, I, I kind of jumped out in front of God, got myself in a situation, but my employer didn't treat me very well on top of that, and so it was just a bad situation. I had left a job that I had been at for about uh, 18, 19 years, probably could have worked there the rest of my life if I wanted to, had a 401K and all those things that you're supposed to do. I remember I left that job, and I took a job, and a couple months into it, I found out that First of all, they never even trained me for the job I thought I was getting, which is in sales. Um, they had me working back in the warehouse, which, you know, is a great job, but it wasn't what I was hired for. And I remember that they hired someone about the same time as me, and I thought it was kind of weird that he was doing my job, but I was shipping boxes in the warehouse. But, you know, I worked, and then I remember there was a meeting where they told me, well, you misrepresented yourself on the resume. You have no people skills. And I'm like... Now, I ain't perfect, but I can talk a little bit, and I'm pretty good with people most of the time. All right. And so, and I had been in sales and those kinds of jobs before, and so it was, you ever been in a, in, in a, in a situation where the room just closes in around you? You ever been in one of those? And, and the words that come out of people, now listen, you do not wrestle with flesh and blood or with principalities and powers of darkness. So realize people are not, people are not the enemy. You got to remember, if you're going to, if you, if you get nothing else out of today's message, you need to realize people are not the enemy. People deserve to be loved. Every person that you're going to run into for the rest of your life has a, has a, has a life that has value. They have problems. They have dreams. They have challenges just like you and me. And we should never think lightly of other people. They're not the enemy. We all have one enemy and his name is Lucifer. It's called Satan the devil. And he wants us to think that we're one another's enemies and that God's our enemy because he's a liar. Jesus called him the father of lies. But I was in that meeting and that room was closed in and around me and they said, well, we can't continue to have you here for what we're paying you. And so we're going to have to cut your pay. And they were going to cut my pay by the, what my house payment was. I think my house payment back then was, I don't know, maybe 400 bucks, 400, 500 bucks a month. And they said, we're going to cut your pay by that much. And I'm like, gulp. And we're going to take all your insurance benefits away because we can't afford to pay them. And you really misrepresented yourself in the interview. I remember I looked at the guy who hired me. Another person was hitting me like this. And, and there's words that come out. Sometimes the enemy will use people to get his words out. Again, the people aren't the enemy. But it was one of them things. It's like only the devil could know to wound me in those areas. And these words just came flying out. Just like that, just flying out like that, one after the other. I didn't share this story first service, so I, this must be for somebody, so you better get a lot out of this. Because <laughs> I got off my notes, and they're good notes. All right. <laughs> I remember I sat there, and I thought, my gosh, what am I going to do? We were a one-income family. Trish was home with the kids. They were all, like I say, Tony was the oldest. He probably was five. When this happened, that would have made Aaron just a baby. Yeah, my goodness, it was a long time ago. And then Selena in the middle. I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, what's going on here? It was the first time I really believed God and stepped out and believed him for a new job. And, you know, you ever trust God for something? It's like, oh, this is awesome. And then you get hit in the face. It was one of those things. If that hasn't happened to you, it will. Okay. So, and, and so... <laughs> But listen, you can have hope. I, I'm, listen, if you think life is a bed of roses, you're wrong. Every person that is successful in any walk of life will tell you that it is filled with mistakes. It is filled with people that, that don't keep their word. It is filled with people that will hurt you, but they're not the enemy. You've got to overcome those things. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. John 14, read it for yourself. But he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world so you need his overcoming because he's perfect and he will perfect his plan in your life. But I remember I left that, that meeting and didn't have cell phones back in those. Boy, this was a long time ago, Pastor Bob. I'm not as old as you, but I'm close. Okay. And so I remember no... How did we exist without cell phones? Do you all realize, you probably do, if you want to make a phone call and you weren't at home, you had something called a pay phone? I don't even know if they exist anymore. They might somewhere. I don't see them. I don't, they, they do. They do still have them. But, but that's all you had. So if you couldn't get to a pay phone, and if you got to a pay phone and Clark Kent was using it, you couldn't make a call anyway. 
one or two of you got that. Okay. <laughs> so I remember I stopped somewhere on the way home, and I knew some people that knew some people, and I found myself a part-time job before I even got home and broke the news to Trish because I knew I was going to have to do something because I couldn't afford to take that kind of pay cut for my family. Couldn't do it. There's no way. I knew we couldn't. So I got a part-time job, and I was going to Bible school at the time. Remember, I came home, and I, I told Trish, and said, well, I'm going to have to drop out of Bible school because I'm going to have to work this 40-hour job, and then I'm going to have to work another 20, 30 hours until we can get back on our feet. And let me just tell you this. Husbands, that's what a responsible man does, by the way. But when you do that and then are open to God, he'll do something better. But I, met, I said, this is just what I'm going to do. I, I got to drop out of Bible school. Didn't want to, but I want to take care of my family for a season. So I made those decisions. I remember I came home, got a call from my mother. My stepfather had passed away. It was one of the, you ever have one of them days you're like, okay, it can just get better anytime now. And I remember going out to his funeral and my stomach in knots, three days, couldn't eat. I went back. I said, well, give me the weekend and I'll come back and tell you about the generous offer that you've made me, which was to cut my pay. So I came back that Monday, Trish and I prayed through that weekend, and here's what we've always done. We pray together, but we also pray separate, especially when it's big life decisions. We pray separately and get a hold of God, and if, if our answers aren't the same, we don't do anything because we don't want to manipulate or persuade one or the other in one way or another because we love each other, we respect each other very much, and it would be very easy to mislead one another. It just would. So we don't want, so we say we're going to pray and we, until we get the same answer. We're going to compare notes. And we did. And God told me, he said, look, I want you to, I've seen that you figured out a way to get another job. And, you know, God's always talked to me this way. I, I tell you, I've come a long way because I'm a recovered workaholic. You got to realize that. I've always figured out ways to make this work and that work and get this going and get that going. And those days are done because I just, if he ain't doing it, I don't want any part of it. I don't, I don't have time for that. But he was working in me, and he still is. I haven't arrived somewhere. And, but I'm not where I used to be, thank God. And you shouldn't be where you used to be. If you've been living for Jesus a year, three years, five years, 10 years, 20, 30, you shouldn't be where you used to be. All right? And so I prayed, and the Lord said, well, you can do it your way, Tony, because that's what you normally do. This is how the Lord talked to me. He says, oh, you can trust me, and you can stay in Bible school, and I'm going to provide for your needs on that pay cut. We've seen God provide in phenomenal ways since then. I've shared so many stories from this pulpit, but this is just one God put on my... It's the first time we had seen God provide in such a supernatural way. And I remember, I said, okay. I went and I talked to the dean at the Bible school that I was, I was going to. I said, I'm going to have to pull out of Bible school. I can't afford it anymore. He said, you don't have to pull out at all. He said, we're going to pay for your tuition. So I didn't have to worry about the money. So God said, okay, I told you. And I went back on that Monday, and I said, they're ready for me to quit. You realize what was going on. They thought I'd quit. I don't, it's not the way you treat employees, but people sometimes do that. And, they, and I came back, much to their surprise, I didn't quit. I said, well, I'll take that job. And, and the woman who was wanting me to quit went. So now she was stuck with me. I worked there for six or eight months. And we didn't miss a beat. I tell you, there was, and I'm kind of a, you know, I'm a very calculating type of person. I'm, I'm delivered from a lot of that. Thank you, Pastor Bob and other people who take care of some of that for me. I don't, I can get caught up in all kinds of budgets and stuff like that. I just can't. And, but I remember we continued to work there, and God met every need. We went back and we, we supported 10. Some of you have heard this story before. Some of you, I know I haven't heard it. At the time, God was teaching us about tithes and offerings. It's just we've always been obedient to that ever since then. And, and we'd write our tithe out to our local church, and then we had 10 missionaries that we provided for. Some of those missionaries we still support, even as an organization. But we'd send them all 10 bucks. Had 100 bucks. I was tithing. I don't even know what my tithe was back then. I, was, I don't even know. But 100 bucks a month. And that may seem like a lot to you. Others, it may not seem like much. But we did, I remember I'd write that tithe, and then I'd $10 to Ted and Joanne, $10 to Paul and Colleen, $10 to Rick Renner, $10 to Rick and Kelly Martin. I'd just go on, and we'd send that 10 bucks out. And then what was left, somehow God provided for us. 
All right? And we, and, and we continue, but that wasn't the end of the miracle. I had this peace on the inside that I had not experienced at that point in my life. Listen, if you're going through a painful situation, the way you endure it and allow God to perfect in you is going to control the outcome. If you're in a very rough time right now, you can grow and you can share stories like this with other people. I know some of you have great stories you could share. Others of you, God's still working that story. But I remembered, I said, God, you're just so good to me. I have a job. I can provide for my family. I know they, they meant something different for me. But they're not the enemy. And God, you're my provider. And I trust you. And it was just a genuine work on the inside. I wasn't just being religious. It was something where I started to see I had a word from God that he was going to provide for my family. It didn't make any sense for me. Oh, they all knew I was a Christian. Before I became a pastor, I was your worst nightmare if you were not a believer. <laughs> Biggest blessing, I might say. But I mean, I'd, you knew, I mean I, I'd carry my Bible around. I wouldn't pre, I'd work. I'd work hard. I didn't waste company's time. So don't do that. That's not what I'm suggesting you do at your job. But you need to be an open book. And if I get a break or something, sometimes I'd fast, go sit in my car, read my Bible. They're like, what's he doing? Reading his Bible? And so I had a couple of them that had walked with Jesus at one point or another. And they said, hey, we're thinking about maybe having a Bible study or something here. And we noticed you like to read your Bible. I said, oh, that'd be, I'd love to be part of it. And they said, well, we, well, we'd like you to lead it. I said, oh, okay. I, when fish jump in your boat, how many know it's good fishing? And so these guys found out they had walked away from God and they weren't even going to church, but they had seen something in me. I'm not bragging. I'm bragging on God if, I, if I'm bragging at all. And then one other person joined and we led this person to the Lord and we led another person to the Lord. And something just started happening in that little shop that I was working in. And I was back, it was back in the days when we had cassette players. How many remember cassette players? All right. If you had a cassette, you know what a pencil was for with a cassette, okay, or a pen, okay, is to rewind that sucker that got stuck in the player. Okay, but I was putting my Ron Cannoli tapes in. Ron Cannoli, baby. <laughs> I loved it. And I'd be packing those, but I'm, I kid you not. I had this little ghetto blaster that I put up on my workstation. They said I could have music. And all day long, I was playing all that worship music. And I'm packing this box, and I'm lifting my hands, and I'm taking this box, and I'm lifting. And I'm just singing, and people are going, what in the world? The person that was going to fire me is like, is he crazy? I, I'm, I am telling you the truth. He wants to perfect in you his perfect work, if you'll let him. But he does it in trials and circumstances if we don't shut him out and close our hearts. And that's what we do. We think, well, I'm not perfect. This ain't ever going to work. And we bolt. But if you would open up your heart in whatever you're facing. I mean, God did incredible things there. I'm there. I just cannot believe we're getting the bills paid. It didn't make sense to me on paper. I kid you not. did not make sense. It was supernatural. And I remember God was ready to move me on, and I felt in my spirit, and Trish felt the same way, that he was taking me to another job. And I remember there was such a presence of God on that place and what God was working. I prayed, and I said, God, if you're going to move me somewhere else, you've got to give me two choices because I'm not missing you again. I don't want to live any other way. i got a taste of this. I want to keep living like this. This is what faith is like. Oh, you're going to have hard times. You're going to have challenges. But the reward is unlike you can, because something happens. Oh, you may not end up with more money, but something happens on the inside. And eventually you're going to have more money. You're going to have breakthrough because something happens on the inside. God's real. It's not just a bunch of stories. I said, I need two choices, Lord. And I prayed, and I had a couple of interviews. Both places wanted to hire me. It got even harder to make a decision. I said, so I made a decision. I'm not kidding you. I made a decision, took that job. Was very respectful to the other job. A year later, God was about ready to help, use us to help plant our first church. And he used the place that I turned down a year later to relocate my family in the same city that we helped plant a church. That's how good God is. And I thought, I'm never going back. I'm not living any other way. This is how I'm going to live from now on. 
And I guess I, I share that story this morning because you may be sitting here and you think, you know what, I feel like Joseph. I've been thrown in the dungeon. Maybe you know that story. His brothers gave up on him, sold him into slavery, didn't have a friend. But then he gets a little bright spot and he starts to work for Potiphar, the servant of the king. But then Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of trying to take advantage of her sexually. She was the one coming on to him. He gets cast in prison, but, but you know what? Joseph just keeps praying, keeps letting God use him. He say, oh, by the way, I think I'll interpret this dream over here. Oh, by the way, I think God's saying this. So, I mean, listen, you need to let God use you in your circumstance for good. Don't let the enemy use you to increase his kingdom. Let God use you and him in you to perfect the perfect work that he's doing on the inside. And that's what faith is. It's not saying, I claim that Cadillac in Jesus' name. Name it and claim it. Why don't you name it and claim some peace on the inside? Because if you went and borrowed it from the bank, you'd get that Cadillac anyway, you liar. All right. I just had to throw that in there. Peace is on. I'm not saying if you if you need to borrow money for a car, borrow money for a car. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stand up here and just be responsible. That's a whole other message. Sorry. See, this is what my mind does. Forgive me. But I love that story because you see Joseph who was a dreamer and God had big dreams and visions. And I know you have big dreams and visions for your life. But the enemy sowed some seeds in there. He wants to take those seeds to take root and to make you bitter and angry and start to do things in your own strength. And if you do things in your own strength, you're going to keep getting the same results you've always got. And it's going to make you miserable. You won't have peace. Oh, you might make more money for a season. Oh, you might have a few more friends than you used to for a while. I'm talking about something that lasts no matter where you are in life, no matter what challenges you face. Listen, you can't steal this. You can't steal it once you allow him to work on the inside. And, and I love it where Joseph is finally reunited with his brothers, and it's been years. This story starts when he's somewhere in his teens. It starts to come to a conclusion when he's probably in his early 40s. I know it's just a few years. Him and his brothers are reunited. And he makes this statement at the very end of Genesis. I know some of you know it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Genesis 50, verse 20. It's the very last scripture you've got up there, Will. It says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God. Somebody say, but God. I'll tell you, that needs to be your favorite prayer. You say something, you need to say, but God says, and I will not be moved. Oh, I might be having a bad hair day. Hey, I have a no hair day every day, so you can have a bad hair day. I saw somebody say this the other day. They say, you know, you see somebody, mom hair don't care. I'm going to get a shirt that says no hair don't care. All right. Somebody say, but God. So whatever you're facing, God's not done. Listen to this. But God meant it for good in order to bring about it as it is this day to save many people. Listen, if you'll take your challenge and let him perfect his perfect work in you, it's about other people. It's about other people. Because people are the prize and other lives hang in the balance of what happens in your life. And God wants to move in a mighty way. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this place, maybe you're going through something terrible. I want to pray for you this morning. We're going to open up the altars, have the worship team sing a little bit more. I know some of you will have to go. We'll dismiss in just a moment, but stay right with me. Maybe there's some here this morning, we had several first service, who don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen, God is not waiting for you to get, get a bunch of things right so that you can perform for him. God did the work for you in the perfect one of Christ so he can perfect in you. God doesn't want to take your fun away. God wants to give you the best life ever. And so if you're here and you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you're watching online, we want to pray for you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you know Jesus, but your life has gotten way off track. You say, i got to recommit my life to him. i become bitter. i become angry. i become religious. i become nasty. We want to pray for you too. So if you're either one of those people you want to come back to Christ or, or, or commit to him for the first time, this is serious stuff. It will change your life. I am telling you, it will change your life right here today. On the count of three, I want to see your hand if you want prayer for that, to come to Jesus or to come back to him. One, two, three. Lift your hand up real quick. Come on. Lift your hand up. Thank you, Jesus. I see that hand right there. Just keep it up. 
We have a young one in the front here. Thank you, Jesus. Just keep your hand up for a moment with every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to make sure that we get this information to you. It will tell you what it means to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, and this book will help you to get on track. So everybody pray this with me. Let's all pray this. Say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He was born of a virgin. I believe that He lived a sinless life. I believe that He was crucified, dead, and buried for my sins. I believe that He rose on the third day for my justification. Jesus, I ask You to forgive me of all my sin. I make you the Lord of my life. I want to live for you all my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Boy, if you prayed that prayer, we are so happy. Thank you for coming out today. Now, the rest of you, we're going to continue to sing. If you need prayer, I would encourage you to come on down front here. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.